Hey everyone, ready for a deep dive into something I think we can all relate to. I'm ready. Awesome. So we're tackling the startle response, you know, that jolt of surprise, the jump, that OM OMG, what was that moment? Yeah, yeah. But we're going beyond the typical jump scare stuff. We're going to explore how this plays out for people on the autism spectrum. Right, because for them, those reactions, they can be way more frequent. And intense. Ew. Our guide today, excerpts from cheap ABA autism and startle response. Super curious to see what we uncover. Me too. Should be interesting. Yeah. So it's fascinating, right? Everyone experiences the startle response. It's like built in for survival. Oh, absolutely. But it can be so different for individuals on the spectrum. Totally. Yeah. That's what I'm really keen to understand, like the why behind that difference. But first, let's define what we're even talking about. How would you explain the startle response itself? Hmm. Well, think of it as your body's emergency alarm, yeah. you know, triggered by a sudden stimulus, a loud bang, a flash of light, someone touches your shoulder out of nowhere. Right, right. It's that surge of adrenaline, the involuntary jump or flinch before your brain catches up to what's happening. Okay, so it's like our body's saying, whoa, something's up, pay attention. Mm -hmm. But if everyone has this alarm system, what makes it different for those on the spectrum? Imagine that alarm going off full blast multiple times a day. Whoa. Even for stuff most people wouldn't even notice, for some on the spectrum, that's the reality. Wow. So the intensity, the duration, the frequency, it's all amplified. Yeah. It's not just a quick jump and then back to normal, unfortunately. Yeah, right. So it lingers. For many, it does, making it really hard to regulate emotions, to focus. Imagine trying to concentrate while your internal alarms are blaring. Oh, that makes total sense. That would be so disruptive. It is. Our source points to sensory processing as a key factor here. Can you break that down for us? Absolutely. A lot of autistic individuals experience hypersensitivity. Meaning? Their sensory systems are super finely tuned. They pick up on nuances others might miss. Loud noises, bright lights, certain textures. What's a mild annoyance for someone could be totally overwhelming for someone with hypersensitivity. So if their sensory experience is already turned up, yeah. any sudden change is going to feel even more jarring. Exactly. It's like their nervous system is on high alert already. So any unexpected input, that bam, mm -hmm. <laughs> exaggerated response. Makes sense. I remember reading about theories as to WHY this heightened sensitivity exists. It's not just being oversensitive, right? No, not at all. Research suggests autistic individuals might have trouble filtering out irrelevant sensory information. Okay. Like you or I might tune out the hum of a fridge, but someone on the spectrum could be processing every single sound. Oh, wow. It makes it hard to figure out what's important, what's a threat, you know? So it's not just the intensity of the input, it's also the brain's ability to sort through it and prioritize. Exactly. It's like trying to talk in a super crowded room, straining to hear one voice while a million others are competing. Yeah, that's a good analogy. And this reminds me of something else the article mentioned, challenges with sensory integration. What does that even mean? So for some people, the different senses, they might not be working together smoothly. Okay. Instead of blending into one experience, the senses feel fragmented. A sudden sound, P-L-U-S, a visual change. That can be super jarring. So it's not just that each sense is heightened, but how they interact creates further challenges. Right. It's like having a puzzle where the pieces just don't quite fit, creates dissonance and discomfort. Okay. Wow. This is really starting to paint a picture. But I got to ask all of this, this amplified startle response, does it really impact someone's life or is it just like being a bit jumpy? -dy? Oh, it can have a huge E impact. Remember, we're talking near constant heightened alertness. Imagine how draining that is physically, emotionally. Now that you mention it, yeah. <laughs> if your alarm system is always going off, you never really relax, feel at ease. Right. And that constant tension, it can lead to way more anxiety, which can then make the sensory stuff even worse. It's a vicious cycle. So the startle response isn't the only problem. It creates this ripple effect. Impacts other areas of life, big time. Sleep social interactions, even physical health in the long run. Wow. Could you give us an example, like right. how this might play out socially? I get avoiding crowds, but what else? Sure. Imagine you're having a conversation. Someone laughs unexpectedly. For someone with this heightened startle response, that could be a huge trigger. Oh, yeah. Flinching, covering their ears, even lashing out verbally. And then that gets misinterpreted. All the time. People think they're being rude, overreacting, when really their nervous system is just wired differently. Right. It's a misconception. And that can lead to more isolation. Exactly. It makes it hard to connect with people. This is really eye-opening. We need to move past 
just seeing someone just jumpy and see the real challenges. What about sleep, though? How does the startle response mess with that? Sleep disruptions are super common, even if someone's not consciously startled during the night. Their sleep cycles can get messed up. Uh. Insomnia, fatigue, all the stuff that comes with bad sleep, it's like their body never truly rests because the nervous system is always on guard. So we've established the startle response is way more than just a fleeting reaction. It's tied to sensory processing, anxiety, sleep, social stuff. It's a huge complex picture. And understanding all these connections, that's essential for providing good support. Which leads to the question on everyone's mind. What can we do to help? Yeah. The source mentions some strategies, so let's dive into those. Okay. And the biggest thing to remember, there's no one solution. Every person is unique. So finding the right approach takes observation, collaboration, really understanding someone's specific needs. That makes sense. Yeah. So where should we start? Well, we've talked about the external stuff, the environment, triggers, but I think it's equally important to look at the internal tools someone can use to manage their responses. Like you mentioned earlier, arousal regulation. Exactly. Arousal regulation is basically recognizing the early warning signs before things get too overwhelming. Hmm. Okay. Like tuning into your body's signals. Yes. Those little cues that things are starting to feel off, you know? So instead of being totally caught off guard by a reaction, you're noticing when your system's getting revved up. Exactly. And that gives you a chance to intervene before the startle response takes over. I'm thinking about mindfulness. Would that be helpful here? Mindfulness can be amazing for this. How so? It's all about paying attention to the present moment without judgment, noticing those physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, as your system starts to get overloaded. So instead of getting swept away by that adrenaline rush, you're creating a space to just observe it. Yes. You shift from reaction to response. And the more you practice, the better you get at recognizing those patterns and developing your own coping strategies. What are some examples of those strategies? They're different for everyone, but some common ones are deep breathing exercises, progressive muscle relaxation, or even just doing a calming sensory activity. Ah, okay. So it's like having a toolkit to help regulate your nervous system. Yeah, exactly. It's about giving people the power to manage their responses. Which makes me think about self-advocacy. What role does that play in all of this? It's huge. It's about learning to communicate your needs clearly, setting boundaries, and asking for support when you need it. So it's not just internal strategies, but also feeling comfortable expressing those needs to others. Exactly. Finding your voice, advocating for your own well-being. Now, earlier you mentioned the social-emotional impact of living with a heightened startle response. Mm-hmm. Could we dig into that more? It seems like it goes way beyond just being startled in the moment. Oh, absolutely. If you're constantly on high alert, bracing for that next unexpected sound or touch, it takes a toll. Yeah, I can imagine that kind of hypervigilance would lead to more stress and anxiety. It does. And that constant stress, that can lead to a whole bunch of other problems, trouble concentrating, feeling isolated, even physical health issues down the line. So it's like the startle response is just the tip of the iceberg. There's this whole web of interconnected challenges beneath the surface. That's a great way to put it. And that's why we need to think about this holistically, you know, addressing not just the startle response, but the anxiety, the sensory sensitivities, the social emotional stuff, all of it. You said earlier there's no one-size-fits-all solution, but are there any common approaches that tend to be helpful? There are, and one that comes up a lot is the idea of sensory diets. Sensory diets. I've heard that term, but not sure what it means. It's not about restricting certain foods, is it? Aha. Uh -huh. No, it's kind of a misleading name. A sensory diet isn't about food. It's about creating a plan of sensory activities. Okay. Activities that help to regulate someone's nervous system throughout the day. So it's like a menu of sensory experiences tailored to their needs. Exactly. And just like a balanced diet with food, a sensory diet gives the nervous system the input it needs to function well. That's a great analogy. What kinds of things might be included in a sensory diet? Well, it depends on the person, but some common elements are proprioceptive input. Proprio what? Proprioceptive. It's basically activities that involve pushing, pulling, lifting, any kind of resistance, you know? Okay. Think jumping on a trampoline, playing with Play-Doh, or even just giving yourself a big hug. Oh, interesting. Then there's vestibular input. And that is movement that stimulates the inner ear. Swinging, rocking, spinning, things like that. It can be really calming. 
I see. So it's about providing different types of sensory experiences throughout the day to keep the nervous system balanced. That's the idea. And when the nervous system is more regulated, those startle responses tend to be less intense. I'm starting to see how all these pieces fit together. Now, I'm wondering about technology. Can that play a role in managing startle responses? Oh, for sure. Technology is changing so fast, and there are some really cool tools out there. One area where we're seeing a lot of progress is in sensory-friendly apps and devices. Like what kinds of apps? Well, there are apps for guided meditations, nature sounds, white noise, even interactive games that help with relaxation and focus. Hmm. So it's like having a calming toolbox right there in your pocket. Exactly. And for people sensitive to light, there are blue light filters for phones, tablets, computers. They can make screen time way more comfortable. That's important, especially with how much time we all spend on screens these days. Right. And there's also interesting stuff happening with wearable technology. Like fitness trackers and smartwatches. I never thought about how those could be helpful for sensory sensitivities. Well, some of them now have features that can track stress levels and give you feedback in real time. Wow. So if you're starting to feel overwhelmed, the device could alert you. Exactly. It might suggest taking a few deep breaths, listening to calming music. It's like having a personal coach right there on your wrist. That's amazing. I love the idea of using technology in that way to support sensory well-being. It's empowering. And it reminds us that technology isn't always a bad thing when it comes to sensory processing challenges. This is all so fascinating. It feels like we're just scratching the surface of what's possible when it comes to supporting people with heightened startle responses. We are. And that's why it's so important to keep having these conversations, keep learning from each other, keep advocating for more understanding and support. This deep dive has really opened my eyes. I feel so much more informed about how to navigate the world with more awareness and compassion. That's great to hear. And it leads us perfectly into the final part of our exploration. Any other thoughts before we move on? So wrapping up our look at autism and the startle response. I'm feeling honestly so much more informed now, like actually empowered after all this. Yeah. It, it is kind of incredible how much we've gotten through, right? From like the brain stuff to actual strategies and that social emotional piece we don't always talk about. That's what really struck me, how much you emphasize like empathy and understanding. Well, that's got to be the basis for any good support, wouldn't you say? Totally. It's easy to, I don't know, underestimate how big of a deal the startle response is if you've not lived it. Right. People want to just brush it off like it's just being sensitive or some behavior thing. But when you get the sensory stuff the neurology behind it, hmm. it's so much deeper. This deep dive has for sure made me rethink some things I thought I knew. It's a good reminder. Everyone experiences things differently, and what seems small to one person could be a massive trigger for another. And that's where compassion comes in, right? Meeting people where they're at, validating what they're going through, offering support without judgment. So true. I'm wondering, are there ways we can specifically get better at that empathy? for ourselves, our communities, especially with something like this, the startle response, which is so hard to see if you don't have it. Education's got to be step one, I think. The more we learn about sensory processing, autism, the specifics of this challenge, the better we can break down our own biases. So actively looking for info from good sources, listening to people's stories, being open to learning from each other. Exactly. And being OK with those tough conversations, you know, asking questions, admitting when we don't know something. Sometimes. The best thing, I is just listening, with an open mind, wanting to understand. Couldn't agree more. As we wrap this deep dive up, want to highlight a few key things we've touched on. Absolutely, laying on me. Number one, that startle response. It's natural. It's protective. Nothing to be ashamed of or try to get rid of completely. Part of how we're wired, yeah. Right. Number two, got to acknowledge for autistic folks, it's often way stronger because of those sensory processing differences. So sudden, unexpected things. They hit much harder, more overwhelming. Exactly. And number three, don't forget there are strategies, tools that can help people manage this. We talked about sensory diets, changing the environment, anxiety stuff, even tech getting in on it. And maybe most importantly, championing that empathy, that understanding. When we come at these challenges with compassion, willingness to learn, that makes the, the world better for everyone. Powerful stuff. Th this whole deep dive has been like a discovery process. I feel... So much more equipped to, you know, go out there with more awareness, more kindness. That's what we hope for, right? Knowledge grows. We question what we thought we knew. And hopefully create a world where everyone's safe, comfortable, able to be themselves. Well said. 
And even though our deep dive ends here, I hope everyone keeps exploring this stuff, find good resources, talk to people who get it, keep asking questions. Because knowledge, IS power, and empathy, that's how we bridge the gap to a world that's more inclusive, more compassionate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this journey. Until next time, keep diving deep into whatever you're curious about.